It's really, it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm, uh, as um, James said, I'm a recovering dean of business school, at, both at Loyola and here at Roger Williams, and now I'm a happy, happy, happy uh, professor of economics. And so when James approached me uh, about uh, putting together something on the Spermacetti Candle Trust, I, I was honored. Uh, somebody just had pointed in my way, said, oh, this guy's a whaling geek. He doesn't know much, but he knows something about whaling. I don't know much about whaling, but I know a little bit because I've become so fascinated by it since moving up to Rhode Island uh, 10 years ago. And it's just a topic that's, uh, that I love. So when James gave me the opportunity to put something together on the uh, Candle Trust, I said, sure, this is classic economics. This is basic microeconomics. It's the stuff I teach. I'll you know, round up a couple of students and, uh, and I'll, they'll help me gather some data. Economists love data numbers. I'll put together information on prices and, and uh, number of competitors and, and I'll throw in some graphs because economists love graphs. Um, well, that, that was my plan, but then as I got into the research, uh, a voice kept coming into my head, and it's the voice of, um, of a friend, uh, some of you, many of you know, uh, Judy Lunn. Judy's a longtime whaling historian associated with the New Bedford uh, Whaling Museum. Uh, Judy's, you know, forgotten more about whaling than I'll ever know. I mean, absolutely. But she's so nice, and so when I, would, when I got to Rhode Island and started going to things at the New Bedford Museum, I would interact with Judy, and I asked her questions about whaling and about um, uh, whaling in, in Rhode Island, and uh, that's something I was very interested in. And she was always very patient. And I'd send her articles um, uh, from, uh, that I found on whaling economics. And, and I said, what do you think about this, Judy? I found this article. And uh, I never will forget her response. She said, well, Jerry, um, you know, he said, you, you, know about, you know more about this article than I do. But frankly, the problem I have with economists is they leave out the human element. She said, to me, whaling history is all about the people. And I think we saw a bit of that in Jonas's uh, report. It's all about the people. And I found that's exactly the case. When I started doing this research, it was. It was all about you know, the, the people that were part of the story. You know, these are the people that I, I would read about. I'd read their quotes. And it's like you know, what they said, what they did was fascinating. So my, my topic, my research turned from one of grabbing some numbers and doing data on candle prices to basically looking at what these people did, what they said. And you know, so if you were here to see a lot of regression equations and graphs, you're gonna be disappointed. You may be disappointed anyway, but at least you'll know in advance you're gonna be disappointed. Uh, so the people were fascinating to me. All, all these people in this, that we'll talk about today um, but I start, I'm an economist, so I start with the man, Adam Smith, the same person I talk about in the first day of my principles class. You know, Adam Smith is basically the father of modern economics. He, you know, he wrote The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, and it is the fundamental work. Again, I, I start my classes by talking about Adam Smith, uh, and what Adam Smith is most famous for, uh, you, you probably are aware, is, is this concept of the invisible hand. Adam Smith explaining how markets work and, and the, the role of self-interest in a market economy. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own interests. You know, you know, why do we get fed? Because people can make a profit by feeding us. What gets produced in a market economy? Things that people want. Well, that's great, that's the public interest. Isn't that wonderful? Well, why? Because that's how you make a profit. So, so this, is, you know, this is what Smith is, is best known for. But I thought it was kind of strange, or not strange, but ironic that Smith was working on this book at the exact same time covered by this topic, that is the Spermacetti Candle Trust, which runs from like you know, 18, or 1750 to 1776, the same time that you know, Smith is working on this work. I said, well, I wonder if Smith knew anything about whaling. You know, he's an observer of, of, um, of, of the world, the way the world works. I wonder what Adam Smith had to say about whaling. And sure enough, Adam Smith had, a, I think, a very insightful comment about the whaling industry. And I love this comment because he says, it starts out, the New England fishery in particular was before the late disturbances. That's something we call the American Revolution. You know, so before these little disturbances over, over on that side of the Atlantic, you, know, you had this great fishery in New England. And then he talks about the whale fishing. And I think this is very insightful. He says, 
The whale fishery, despite the fact that we in Great Britain provide bounties for our whalers, and they did that basically to try to compete with the Dutch. Uh, but, uh, so the British government was throwing money at British whalers, but he said the whole produce of the British whaling industry you know, doesn't really exceed the bounties. It's, it's nothing. But in New England, where there is no bounty paid, it's carried on to a great extent. And you know, the reason for this, something economists call comparative advantage, but we're not going to get into that. But I just thought it was very insightful that, that Adam Smith pointed out that you know, whaling is successful in the colonies, not in Great Britain, and he knew the reason why. But the real reason why I start with Adam Smith is another comment. This is one of the more famous comments, I think, for at least to economists, that shows up in The Wealth of Nations. And it's this. It's his comment about the tendency to monopolize industries. He says, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment or diversion, when you know, the conversation is going to turn to a conspiracy against the public or some contrivance to raise prices. As Smith was writing that kind of cynical comment, there was a group of men meeting over here, basically in Rhode Island, Newport, Providence for the most part, doing exactly this. And that's the topic of you know, this subject. That is, that's the subject of, of this whole you know, idea that these guys were putting together a monopoly. And they call themselves the United Company of Spermaceti Chandlers. So from 16, uh, 1761 on until the uh, 1775, 1776, um, these individuals, owners of these Spermaceti candle makers, joined in a basic classic conspiracy in restraint of trade. They, they you know, created the United Company of Spermaceti Chandlers or candle makers. They did basically this, classic monopoly. We're going to set maximum prices that we'll pay for our resources, and we're going to agree on minimum prices we'll charge for the candles. And by the way, we don't want any more candle makers coming in. You know, classic conspiracy in restraint of trade against the public. And so it's, it's just, you know, it's pure economics. Well, you know, the problem is with any such cartel, sounds good on paper, but there's still the, the world of, of competition they have to deal with. So but for the next 15 years, these people would meet periodically, these guys would meet periodically uh, around, for the most part, Rhode Island, sometimes in Massachusetts, to, to you know, finalize, to fine tune these agreements in restraint of trade. And that's, you know, that's what we're talking about today. It starts with the candle industry. Uh, when, I was, when I said, well, I'll recruit a couple of students to work with me on this topic, I remember that uh, I said, yeah, would you like to work? I'm doing some research and it's going to involve whaling. Oh, whaling, that's good. That's, that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, they, they were very excited about that. Then I said, well, technically, it's about candles. I could see their faces like, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's candles. You know, and then I had to educate the students on, you don't know how important candles are. You know, candles you know, were a significant, significant part of the history of artificial lighting. Basically, this is what allowed us to expand the usable hours in the day, you know, so that you could both produce and consume after dark. So candles that date back to like the Roman times were incredibly significant. The major source of fuel for candles for centuries was animal fat or tallow. You know, the problem is smoky, stinky, but that's, that's what you could produce at home. Uh, there was a better fuel, which was beeswax, much more expensive. The beeswax candles basically ended up in churches. The churches were the ones, the institutions who could afford the cost of beeswax, beeswax uh, candles. But, but again, that's what we had for centuries, the tallow candle. Well, around the middle of the 18th century, things changed in a big way. You had two important innovations around 1750 that were game changers for this place right here, Nantucket and whaling. And you know, they are basically the installation aboard whaling ships of the Triworks, 
because as Noah was talking about, you know, these ships went out for years. You know, how could they do that? Well, they became floating factories because of the installation of triworks. Uh, so which, uh, by the way, it's, you know, it's those things of rendering the, the fat from the whale. The other, and then storing it in these, these um, uh, barrels underneath the, the, the ship. But the other big event that happened about this time was the discovery of the value of this. The spermaceti waxy subject that's found in the head cavity of this guy. And so this was a game changer because somebody figured out that if you could separate this spermaceti that's found in the head cavity, the waxy subject that remains is a really effective candle fuel. And the byproduct, the oil that you squeeze out of it, that's also an incredible luminant. So, going back up for a second, so basically, you know, this is what happened in the middle of the century. That the, you know, the waxy subject, uh, substance can be used to produce a candle that's superior. The uh, head matter then has these two ingredients, has a value three times that of ordinary whale oil. So what does this do? Well, there's no, it's incentives. It's all about incentives. This gives us an incentive to go after the sperm whale. That's where the money is. You know, is, is, I remember Judy saying, well, you know, why whaling? It's all about money. This provided the economic incentive to go after, you know, these creatures. And where are these creatures? They're everywhere. You know, you can't just, you know, go out for a month, catch some sperm whale, come back to shore. No, that's why the tri works were so important. So essentially, it's the combination of figuring out the spermaceti concept and the triworks that created an industry. Uh, to give you an example of the, the impact, um, in 1748, basically about the time this started to happen, the fleet at Nantucket was composed of 60 whaling ships. Ten years later, 1758, 118. It doubled in a 10-year period. Why? The sperm whale, going after that creature. By 1771, 150 ships annually flying out of Nantucket. So basically, you know, why do spermaceti candles matter? It's partly what made Nantucket Nantucket. It's partly what made this place so vibrant. Um, who, who figured this out? Who figured out this great innovation of spermaceti candles? We don't know. You know so. Um, there's ads in, that show up in a Boston newspaper from, I think, 1748, advertising spermaceti candles exceeding all others for beauty, sweetness of scent when extinguished, duration being more than double that of uh, tallow candles of equal size, dimensions of flame nearly four times more, emitting a soft, easy, expanding light. Great marketing. You know, say, but where these candles come from, we don't know. We know where they were sold in Boston. We don't know. There's no evidence that there was candle making going on in the colonies at that time. We think that, you know, well, the experts, those experts in candle making, uh, figure that it must have been, you know, somewhere in Europe, probably Portugal or, or, or the Netherlands. Um, uh, James, if, you know, you want to finance me and my wife, we're happy to go to Europe, spend our summers there, searching through the dusty archives, to come up with the holy grail. Who invented the spermaceti candle? We really don't know, but it's, uh, nor do we know who was the first spermaceti candle maker in North America, because there are a few sub, uh, suspects out there. Uh, the people down in Newport will, will tell you that, you know, Jacob Rodriguez Rivera, a Sephardic Jew from um, Portugal, he brought the secrets over, and we do know that around 8, 1750, he was, you know, looking for, he was in the market for spermaceti. To, to, to make candles. Uh, others, people in Providence uh, will claim, no, it says John Vanderlyde, he married into the Brown family and he brought these ideas over from uh, the Netherlands. But the primary suspect, I think, is a guy named Benjamin Crabb uh, from good old Rehoboth, Massachusetts. Um, right outside Bristol, basically. Um, because it, it's documented that uh, in 1749, he went to the Massachusetts House of Representatives with a petition representing that he and no other person in the province 
has the art of pressing, fluxing, and crystallizing of spermaceti and coarse spermaceti oil, and of making candles of the same. He claimed to have already erected presses and procured utensils for manufacturing, quote, candles of such transparency and luster and burning that seed all others. Because of the expense involved, what do you want? He wanted a monopoly. He asked the, uh, the Massachusetts legislature for sole use, exercise, and benefits of making candles of coarse spermaceti oil within this province for a term of 14 years. Well, the, you know, the government must have been somewhat impressed with him because uh, the Massachusetts General Court granted Crab a monopoly for 10 years. They further stipulated that the candle works would have to be located within seven miles of Boston and that within five years he must well and fully instruct five of the inhabitants of this province in the art that he claimed to possess alone. Now, for some, whatever reason, we don't know what, but Crabbe didn't like those conditions. He passed. He did what white people do, he moved to Rhode Island. He moves down the road to Rhode Island and sets up a candle works, which promptly burns down. Now that could be the end of our information about Benjamin Crabb, except in Providence, he somehow connects with the Brown family. Now, you know, I think most of us are aware of the, the impact of the, the Browns of Providence Plantation, uh, going back to Chad Brown, one of the co-founders of Providence. Uh, by the middle of the 18th century, you have four brothers, Nicholas, Joseph, John, uh, that's John Brown there, uh, Moses, who are sons of James Brown, uh, who was deceased uh, after James' death. His sons were, the four boys were raised by and went into business with Obadiah Brown, uh, James's brother. The Browns would, of course, create, you know, a colonial commercial empire. They're involved in shipbuilding, shipping, rum, cocoa, China trade, some whaling, they did some whaling, in fact, uh, slaves, slave trading, molasses, iron, you know, they, but a very early venture in the development of this empire was when Obadiah Brown connects with Benjamin Crabb, hires him to set up a candle works, help set up a candle works in Providence, which they did in the, um, pretty much in the India Point. If you're driving into Providence on 195, cross over the India Point Bridge, look over to your left. That, that region right there on the bay is where they set up the initial um, uh, candle works. Browns were good at most everything they did. They were very aggressive, very connected. They were the ultimate networkers. They, they made connections everywhere. And shortly thereafter, by uh, 1756, uh, they had gotten rid of Crab. He disappears from history. And they now have the largest candle works in the American colonies. Uh, I'm not going to go over the candle production process. That's for the tour after this, <laughs> so, so, but it's, the, making these candles was not easy. It was a complex nine-month process. It involved a number of stages and this wonderful spermaceti press that is, uh, you know, for your viewing in the, uh, in the museum. Uh, but, you know, so it takes a while to, to develop this. And, uh, oh, I forgot, I have, uh, have the, uh, some spermaceti with me. Uh, but basically, at the end of all this process, you have this white, waxy substance uh, that can be molded into, into candles. Yeah, it looks just like, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So if anybody would like some um, spermaceti wax, just a hole in the touch, you know, this is what you end up with. You end up with this. Again, but it's, a, it's, not, it's, not like, it's not like melting animal fat. It's much more complex. It's a nine-month process involving this huge, this huge press. Uh, and what you come up with are candles that are basically superior to all others. This is a, this is a, um, a label placed on the candles by the uh, Brown Company. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's um, spermaceti candles warranted pure and made and sold by Nicholas Brown and Company in Providence in the colony of Rhode Island. Uh, the same information in French for, for, you know, for the European market. Uh, so again, but I guess it's a fascinating process and I, I urge you to, uh, if you haven't already, I'm sure most of you have already been to the museum to see the press, but it's a, it is a fascinating process. But what, it come, what you come up with is a, is a product that is better than all the rest. It's a luxury product. Candles wrapped in blue paper, packed in boxes, 
with you know, labels affixed, we just saw. Um, they become a specialized element of the whale oil trade. Uh, they're a luxury item. They were purchased by affluent customers throughout the um, colonies and also, you know, especially for export. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, I just ran across him, a satisfied customer. You know, Ben Franklin, an early adopter, as they, they say. Uh, this is what Ben had to say about him in the 1750s. He was impressed by these quote, new kind of candles to read by that afford a clear white light may be held in the hand even in hot weather without softening, that their drops do not make grease spots like those from common candles, and that they last much longer and need little or no snuffing. You know, so, so that's an endorsement from Ben Franklin. Another endorser, George Washington. Washington, of course, could afford <laughs> this. He, he was not a poor person. And um, the estimates are that he, he could afford to burn approximately 12 spermaceti candles a night at Mount Vernon. Now, George Washington was a very analytical person, and he actually did some analysis and said he concluded that burning a spermaceti candle five hours each night for one full year would cost approximately eight pounds. And that was amount far beyond the financial reach of most Americans, uh, double what it would cost to have uh, similar tallow candles. So, so it's, a, it's an important product, of, you know, but it's an expensive product. Now again, well, that's, just, that's just another label. This is uh, the Palmer Company up, up in uh, Germantown near Boston. That's their uh, Sperma City Candle label. So the industry starts to develop. By the 1760s, you have seven candle makers in operation, mostly in Newport. The Jewish merchants of, of Newport uh, basically became the leaders in the industry other than Brown. Brown was the, the largest. Um, but the, the world of supply and demand hits the candle makers very early on. That is, this is you know, a product that is you know, expensive, but it's all dependent on the head matter. It's all dependent on the head matter. Who has the head matter? The whalers. And so these candle makers were dependent on the suppliers. And you know, they were saying, well, it's already an expensive product. You know, it costs us, it's, it's complex to produce. And now we have to pay for this head matter. And, and they started you know, basically whining about the cost of head matter. Uh, and um, it's, it's, um, yeah, it puts the whalers in a strategic position. In fact, this is another quote that I like. This is from a, an agent in Boston, Henry Lloyd. Uh, to Aaron Lopez, who's one of the major Newport uh, candle makers, um, the agent warned him against, against being too nice and critical with these Nantucket men, for I can assure you that nothing can be done with them in that case. The only way is to make the best terms possible with them whenever you have occasion to purchase, but tis vain to attempt to tie them down to any measures they do not like. So again, the candle, so suddenly, you know, you now starting to have this conflict between the candle makers and the suppliers of this, this vital product. You know, uh, Brown and, and some of the manufacturers wrote to um, uh, Joseph Roach complaining that, you know, we don't want to pay above this for the head matter. We, we got to make a buck, you know, we can't pay. You know, Roach just ignored them, so what do they do? Oh, this is just this is Newport. I just had that in the slide because it's this is colonial Newport. This is a, again this is where most of the candle making was done. Isaac Stale was one of the uh, Newport producers. But basically, what this leads to, Brown calls for a meeting of candle makers, for, and again spells it out for the purpose of uniting our endeavors to reduce the price of head matter and to join in a plan so much for our mutual interest. So basically, this is the trust. This is the cartel. We're going to meet together. We're going to set prices. We're going to join in a plan for mutual interest. So they met uh, in Newport in 1761. They agreed, and I love this comment, they agreed to have two meetings each year at the best tavern in Taunton. Now, I'm willing to go to Europe and try to seek out who developed the, you know, uh, Spermacetti candle. I don't know that I wanted to do research in Taunton to find out where was the best tavern. I couldn't find it anyway, but that, that's where they're going to meet. They're going to meet, you know, annually. So 
this is, and this is what they said. This is, this is, these are the articles of agreement. We agree to pay, we're not gonna pay more than, and again, they set the price based on the price of brown oil, uh, regular spermaceti oil. So we're not gonna pay more than a certain amount for the head matter. We're not gonna pay agents more than two and a half percent. We're not gonna sell candles for less than this price. And flat out, you know, right here, members are pledged to employ all, I love this, fair and honorable means to prevent other firms, you know, for, you know, to, you know, prevent other firms from coming into the industry. And this last one's kind of interesting. You know, th this one, um, this was on the first agreement. And again, they did these agreements every couple of years throughout the life of the trust. It, this one disappeared, but it's a, it was kind of an interesting approach that they were thinking about. That if we can't keep the price of head matter down, we'll become suppliers. We'll, we'll go out and we'll fit out 12 vessels and we'll go into whaling. But they, they didn't follow through on that, but it was just kind of interesting that they, they somewhat threatened that. Um, well, the issue with cartel agreements like this is that they sound good on paper, but, you know, I talk, I talk about this in class, that, that, you know, the problem with the cartel is that, yes, you can talk about we want a monopoly profit, but individual members of that agreement have a tendency or an incentive to cheat on the arrangement. And sure enough, within months of the agreement, you had accusations of cheating. Um, in, you know, by July of 1762, uh, owners of the three leading Newport candle works were writing to Richard Cranch, the candle maker in Boston, setting forth alleged violations which, if true, were tantamount to destruction of the union. Uh, they had certain information that most of the buyers at Nantucket had purchased head matter at a price substantially above that stipulated in the Articles of Association. And then they went on to say, I, I love this, this was diametrically repugnant of the letter and spirit of the articles which were intended for mutual benefit. So how many of us have used that term lately? Diametrically repugnant. So when you disagree with somebody, don't say, I disagree your actions are diametrically repugnant. You know. But that's, that's how they felt about it. You know, so they, you have these accusations flying back and forth about cheating and so forth. So they agree to meet again to try to tighten the arrangements. So they, they meet in 1763, again setting the maximum price on head matter, uh, prohibiting outsourcing. Uh, they, they also came up with a list of 10 approved suppliers of head matter. Basically, the, the, they, they listed 10 I think eight of them were Nantucket whaling companies. Uh, and the innovation of this was a common stock. They said a common stock, we're gonna treat all head matter as a common stock for the United Company. And we're gonna allocate this head matter on these conditions. And so they basically divided up, whatever head matter comes in will be allocated to us, the individual candle makers, Certain parts, you know, Brown and Company got the biggest share. The nine other houses would receive between two and 14 parts each. So again, this was the, the common stock approach. Uh, the industry, you know, grew slowly at first, in part because there was a recession following the end of the Seven Years' War. Uh, they, they did what they could to, to, to try to control the, the information about how to set up these presses uh, and the industry did, you know, grow somewhat quickly but throughout the 60s. Uh, by the end of the 60s, you had only, you know, 10 or 12 candle houses in effect. But then we start seeing the role of the Roach family and the concern with the candle makers about the Roaches. Uh, in, uh, in the early, in the late 60s, I guess, the head matter prices were going to continue going up. They started looking at you know, Joseph William Roach saying, you're the problem. You know, the problem is you're sending head matter to London, reducing our supply, and of course, supply and demand, reduce our supply, that's driving the price up even more. So they're accusing Joseph Roach and his company and his family of shipping off some of the head matter to London. Roach's response is right here. You know, he responds to say, hey, look, I didn't do it. And by the way, I've talked to people in Boston, and I understand that Parliament, 
they might just prohibit the manufacturing of any head matter, or they're going to have the duties taken on. Any, either of these is going to be fatal to you. you know, so he, he responds very directly to, to the candle makers saying, you know, things could be worse. You know, and he'd be sorry if this branch of business is wholly stopped in this country, because we always was willing to do all of you as much good as we possibly could. And then the telling, <laughs> the telling last statement, without doing too much injustice to ourselves, that is, self-interest. And he goes on to, you know, to, to lay out my favorite Roach quote of all time, that is, gentlemen, you know, you talk about, let's be friends, let's work together, you keep the price down, you can make a decent profit on the head matter, we'll make a decent profit on the, you know, on the candles, you know, the Roach family basically had none of that. He said, look, you know, all friendship that can be expected into trade is to let your friend have a thing at the same price that others would give for it. In other words, it's the market, people. You know, here's the market price of head matter. You may be my friend. I may like you. This is what you're paying. You know, and so Roach was very much, you know, you know again, you know, we'll keep head matter in this country if it's not against our interest. Well, again, it, if there's a market outside the country, you know, it was against their interest. So, so Roach pretty much said, you know, we're not going to, you know, play by the rules. We're playing by the market rules. Here's the market value of head matter. You want it? You pay the market price. Not about friendship. It's not about clubs meeting in Taunton. It's about the market. In the 1770s, Things got a little bit better. The economies, the colonial economy improved uh, in the 1770s, uh, late 60s and 70s. Shipments made, uh, um, kept, you know, the head matter prices continued to go up. The spermaceti candle prices went up a little bit. And the number of spermaceti works started to increase. So while the candle makers were whining about, you know, oh, yeah, we can't make a profit. They obviously were doing okay because people were starting to enter the industry. And by 1774, you had 20 candle houses, again, mostly in Newport and Providence, mostly in Rhode Island. Uh, Brown and Company continued to be the dominant candle firm. So things were, in the whaling industry was, was going pretty well at that time as well. But then things start to crumble. Why do they crumble? The Roaches. The Roach family of Nantucket. In 1765, Joseph purchases from Joseph Russell, the developer of that new planned community uh, over in Dartmouth called Bedford. And somebody pointed out some years later that there was already a Bedford in Massachusetts and they had to change the name. So they changed it to New Bedford. But basically, you know, this Russell, the developer, is setting up a whaling community there Roach is an early uh, enthusiast about this. He moves to New Bedford in 1767 with two of his sons. William stays here. A year later, uh-oh, New Bedford has a candle house. Now, the owners officially were Joseph Russell, the developer, and Isaac Hallen, who's a candle maker that Russell brought in from Newport. But it was well known that the instigator of this was Roach. Roach is the one that moved New Bedford to a candle maker, candle making location. And this, you know, was not good news for the United Company. So, you know, they, they try to enlist this new firm in the United Company. Howland does, you know, uh, agree to join the United Company, but things get even worse. Thanks to, well, actually, they get worse <laughs> for the candle makers, thanks to this man, William Roach. In 1772, rumors start spreading around Nantucket that Roach is going to build a candle factory. And two years later, that candle factory is a going concern, you know, right up on Straight Wolf. Um, this was not good news for the Candle Trust. Now you have a whaler, a very dominant, successful, Whaler. And the, again, the, the Roach family was, you know, they were big players. You know, uh, 
the, um, yeah, uh, Jonas mentioned, you know, the, the, the Quaker influence, and, and the Roach family had been dominant players in the 18th century in the whaling industry, in the Nantucket economy. Um, the, the, uh, the best quote, yeah, like talking about the Quaker influence, the best quote I ran across uh, to describe the, the Quaker impact in Nantucket was, said, ah, uh, yeah, the Quakers of Nantucket, neutrality in all things except the pursuit of profit. You know, they, wanted to stay, they wanted to stay neutral in the revolution. They were, you know, they were pacifist, but when it came to profit, the Roach family knew how to make a profit. They were an early, you know, again, Joseph Roach's movement to New Bedford, that was an indication of, hey, we're gonna expand to a new location. Why? Profits. William Roach said, okay, that's it. I'm tired of, you know, playing with the candle trust. He goes into the candle making business right at the end of Straight Wharf. He does, they, they do kind of panic, but they get him to join the United Company. He's part of the, seven, I think it's December 1774 agreement. Roach is one of the signers of that agreement. But when it came to that common stock, he received a quota of 13 parts of 181, which was significantly less than Brown and a couple of other players. This did not sit well with Mr. Roach. So the next month, January, he writes a long letter to the cattle makers, pointing out that, hey, at that meeting, do you recall, I wanted a share equal in proportion to anyone on the continent. In other words, the Browns. I wanted, you know, I wanted as big a share as anyone has of that head matter. But you ignored me. You divided the head matter more on the number of, you know, candle makers there were, regardless of, you know, how this impacted the procuring of head matter. Then he goes on to say that you realize that in a bad year, my ships bring in more head matter than you allotted me. He said, oh, not to mention my brother Francis, oh, he's out there whaling too, and uh, with whom you may reasonably suppose I have some influence. So again, I, I love the way, you know, William Roach, you know, positions things. And he included, concluded with this wonderful quote. You know, and this, this is just, this says it all. This, you know, here's the trust crumbling. If you insist on keeping me to the proportion you allotted me, I believe I shall comply with it, but I certainly know it will not be for your interest to drive me to such an unreasonable compliance. He said, yeah, I don't like it. I'll go through the motions, but you don't want, you don't want to test me. What happens? The trust crumbles. Basically, you know, the, the, the members continued to ignore him, but they knew they had to do something. They knew they had to, we got a roach problem. We have, we have an issue. You know, we have, we have a whaler who now basically has control over two candle firms, New Bedford and Nantucket. And so we got to come up with a way of dealing with this. So they set a meeting for March of that year. The, the meeting you know, it was down in Newport, but for some reason people couldn't get there. They adjourned with, you know, because they didn't have enough members present. They said, okay, we gotta meet in April. We gotta talk about this issue. Well, by April, you had Lexington and Concord. The trust never met again. The war, as you know, crippled most of colonial commerce, including the candle making. Many of these candle makers that we've, you know, in Newport especially, you know, disappeared during the, during the revolution. The Brown family stayed in the business for a while, but they were never the, you know, it was never, they were never a big player after, after the war. So after the war, what happens? You have the revival of whaling, as we know, uh, but it followed the Roach model. The Roach model of the integrated business. The whaling merchants are gonna be in control. They're gonna control production, refining, manufacturing, distribution, there's gonna be benefits derived from every step in this process. There's gonna be commissions, sales, profits, and we're gonna branch out into secondary operations, banking, insurance. So after the war, 
Wayland comes back big time, but it's big time in the Joseph William Roach model. Candle making basically changed. The candle industry did recover because they, you know, it was still a good, it was still a, you know, a great product, better than the alternatives. But you know, it changed. The center of candle, candle making shifted here. By 1792, you had 10 candle plants on this island. By the end of the century, you had 20. So Nantucket becomes the candle center. This is why, you know, if you walk down, you know, walk out that way, you, know, you run into Candle Street. Or if you walk over there, you run into Candle House Lane. And of course, we know, you know, the museum is what? It's located in an old candle factory. Um, let's see, I think I have a, this by the way, uh, everybody recognize this? This is one high street. You know, it's, it's, it's now I think a three bedroom, two bath house that sold four years ago for 1.1 million. That was, that was one of the Nantucket candle factories. It's again, it's one high street. Um, this was after its candle days. This was, you know, this is obviously after the candle works had already moved on to something else. Uh, but it still looks a lot like that, although the landscaping is a lot better. Uh, but, you know, so, so basically Nantucket becomes the center of the candle making world. You know, what does it say? You know, what's my conclusion about this trust? Well, again, cartels are difficult to carry out. Cartels you know, market forces, self-interest. You know, that's going to challenge any cartel. You know, individual members. You know, if, if somebody asked me if I were doing this for my students, like, you know, Joan was talking about, you know, I'd say, well, you know, without the roaches, you know, how would the firm city trust do? And the answer is, it would have fallen apart. Even without roach. Why? Because of this. Because of the realities as I talk about in my class at least, what's the source of monopoly power that last government? You know, if you look at any ongoing monopoly, why does it, because government can keep out competitors. The candle makers couldn't. You know, they, they said we're gonna prevent entry to the market, they couldn't do it. Self-interest, cheating on the agreements. So basically, you know, it was gonna fall apart eventually anyway. But it does represent you know, Colonial America's best first example of monopoly. Monopoly created through out-and-out -out collusive arrangements. The first energy cartel couldn't withstand the competition of the whaling trade. Couldn't hold up against the Roach family. The Roach family understood better than others the value of an integrated enterprise the model changed the structure of the whaling industry. And basically, that vertical integration concept has held on. You know, it's, been, it's been a big part of our American industrial development since the time of the Roaches. So you know, I think that the, the Roach family, again, they weren't the only ones. I'm just saying they were an early adopter. I'm not saying they originated the integrated company, but they were definitely more successful <laughs> than others in terms of pushing it into the marketplace. Um, so just to finish up with uh, Adam Smith again, you know, again, talking about self-interest, you know, his concept of self-interest, you know, William Roach, devout Quaker, pacifist, neutral in all things except the pursuit of profit, you know, was a great example of Adam Smith's invisible hand in operation. It was pursuit of his self-interest, Roach contributed to the growth and development of the industry and to the promotion of the public welfare. Um, again, uh, this, you know, the impact of this industry on this town is, is shown by this building, of course, uh, the Whaling Museum. Uh, is the admission still 25 cents? I'm trying to think, is that, is that, is that, is that the Saturday price or, yeah, but, but anyway, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so again, I say to, to learn more about, uh, about the impact of this industry, you know, if you haven't already spent 
a lot of time looking at that spermaceti press uh, in the museum. It's, it's really uh, worth your while. As I say, I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, industry. I think the, uh, the, the cartel idea itself is, is fascinating. Uh, the Browns were just networkers. They wanted to have this club that will, you know, will, be the, will be the industry. We won't let others in. We'll control this. We'll control that. The Roach family said, no, you know, that's, the markets will control, and we're going to be a big player in the markets. So that's the beginning and end of the uh, Spermaceti Trust. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Just uh, I, speaking of spermaceti and, and the, um, the importance of this, I, I have to end with one quote. Uh, uh, it's, it's not about spermaceti candles. Uh, by the way, did anybody get a chance to see the spermaceti candles I was passing around? Um, that, that's, those were sold at ye old Nantucket Candle Shop, which I think is long gone. Uh, they were sold until the 1950s or 60s, I believe. Uh, now you sell replicas, I believe, in the museum. Um, uh, that was, uh, I got that from Park Madden, who once he learned that I was going to use it for this um, program, he uh, offered to double the price, but I said, James isn't paying for it. Um, but, uh, so, but, uh, and then the, the spermaceti wax itself is up here, but, but this is a quote from John Adams, one of my favorite characters of history, um, about spermaceti oil. Uh, and as ambassador to, Great, when he was ambassador to Great Britain, he was making a sales pitch to uh, Great Britain to import spermaceti oil. And so he met with British Prime Minister William Pitt, uh, trying to convince the British to import spermaceti oil. Now, his initial efforts were not successful, and this is how Adams records his, his sales pitch to, to the British Prime Minister, uh, William Pitt. Adams told Pitt, uh, and this is quoted from his diary, the fat of the spermaceti whale gives the clearest and most beautiful flame of any substance that is known in nature. So poetic. And we are surprised that you prefer darkness and consequent robberies, burglaries, and murders on your streets to receiving as a remittance our spermaceti oil. So John Adams, buy our oil or it's Gotham City for London. I mean, it's just, you know, it's it lights out. So that's how important this, this product was. And again, it helped make Nantucket. I'm happy to be here talking about it. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Great. <laughs>